What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter. I'm rocking my Flatline MMA and Athletics gear. The fight gloves are on. That can only mean one thing. UFC 143 picks coming your way. UFC 143 is going down this Saturday from Las Vegas, Nevada. We've got no fewer than five guys on this card making their UFC debuts, and I think that's going to translate into one hell of a night of fights. So let's get right into them. Starting on the undercard, we got a welterweight fight between Dan Stitkin and Stephen Thomas. Dan Stitkin, 7-1 and one on his MMA career, one of the guys making his UFC debut. Uh, he's an alumni from uh, IFC as well as uh, King of the Cage. Uh, he's coming in on a three-fight win streak, and five of his seven career victories have come by way of submission. Uh, Stephen Thompson, an undefeated 5-0 and in his MMA career, also making his UFC debut. So we got two young, hungry dudes in here trying to get their first win inside the octagon. Uh, Stephen Thompson is a perfect, unbeaten 56-0 and as a kickboxer with, I believe, 39 knockouts. So this guy is a kickboxing prodigy. But at the same time, he also holds black belts in jiu-jitsu and kenpo karate. So this is a guy that is dangerous in multiple facets to the fight game. And in this fight, I am going to take Stephen Thompson. I've got Stephen Thompson to stay perfect. Uh, I figure he'll probably win the fight by TKO. Obviously, he's a stand-up guy, and uh, as long as he can keep the fight standing, then uh, I think for sure he's going to come out on top here over Stitkin. If Stitkin can get the fight to the ground, he's definitely going to have a better shot, because like I said, five of his seven pro wins have come by submission. But I'm going to take Stephen Thompson by a knockout or a TKO. Uh, moving on, middleweight fight between Rafael Natal and Michael Kuiper, <laughs> K-U-I-P-E-R, however you happen to pronounce that. Uh, Rafael Natal, 13-3-1 in his MMA career, 1-1-1 one, one one in the UFC. All three of his UFC fights have gone to a decision, either win, lose, or draw. And uh, seven of those 13 wins in MMA have come by way of submission. So here's another good ground fighter. Uh, facing off again with Michael Kuiper, who is an unbeaten 11-0 and in his MMA career, making his UFC debut. 11-0 and at just 22 years of age, so he's a very young fighter, he's hungry. This is his first fight in North America, has never fought on this side of the pond before. All of his other fights happening uh, spattered, across, spattered across Europe. Uh, and he has finished 10 of his 11 opponents. So he's only had one fight go to a decision. Um, I'm going to go with the experience factor in this one, and I'm going to go with Rafael Natal. I figure this fight's probably going to go to to a decision. Um, Natal clearly favors the ground, and I think uh, Kuiper is a guy that can probably fight wherever... He's good wherever the fight happens to go, but I think for the most part the two of them will probably negate each other's... Uh, major skills, and I think the experience factor is going to favor Natal. So I will take Rafael Natal to win by a decision. Uh, moving on to welterweight, we have Matt Riddle and uh, another UFC newcomer, Henry Martinez. Matt Riddle, 5-3 and three on his career. All of his fights have taken place in the UFC. Uh, he is an alumni of uh, the Ultimate Fighter Season 7, uh, and he's lost his last two fights. He lost to Sean Pearson, and I believe it was, uh, I can't remember the guy's first name, but it's uh, Benoist. Whatever, whatever his first name happens to be. So he's on a two-fight losing streak, facing off against Henry Martinez. Henry Martinez, making his UFC debut, is 8-1 and one on his pro career. He's on a four-fight win streak, uh, two of them by submission, two of them by TKO. Uh, and half of his pro wins, four of eight, come by way of submission. Uh, this is another one where I think I have to go with the experience factor in the UFC. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of, of Matt Riddle. I wasn't a fan of his on the show, and I haven't been a fan of his since. But the kid can fight. I'm going to have to give it to Riddle. I think it will probably go to decision. Um, I like the little bit that I've seen from Henry Martinez. He's a good fighter. Um, but I think just the octagon... The, the mixture of the first time being in the octagon uh, and, you know, facing a quality opponent who has never fought outside of the octagon, uh, I think just slightly f favors Riddle, so I'll give Riddle the edge in a decision victory. 
Uh, sticking with the welterweight division, this is our third welterweight fight so far, uh, Matt Brown versus Chris Cope. Uh, Matt Brown is 12-11 and 11 on his pro career. He's got an even record of 5-5 five and five in the UFC. Um, now, he's lost four of his last five fights, so this could very well be Matt Brown's um, coming out party if... Uh, if uh, if he happens to lose this fight. Uh, his four losses have all come to quality opponents. Uh, Ricardo Almeida, Chris Lytle, Brian Foster, and Seth Baczynski, however you happen to pronounce his name. Uh, and all of those four those four losses have all come by way of submission. As a matter of fact, I believe nine of Matt Brown's 11 career losses have all come by way of submission. So this is a guy that Obviously, he needs to either stop fighting grapplers or um, get uh, get some more time in the gym with his grappling. Um, Chris Cope, five and two on his career, one and one in the UFC. He's an alumni of the Ultimate Fighter season thirteen. Um, He's got uh, two of his wins have come by knockout, two of his losses have come by knockout. Cope is a stand-up fighter, so I don't think Matt Brown is going to have to worry too, too much about getting submitted in this fight. Um, Matt Brown's got heavy hands. I mean, Matt, it's not like Matt Brown can't fight. He definitely can. And I'm going to give Matt Brown this fight. Uh, I always like to sort of side with the guys that, you know, if they lose this, if they lose this last fight, then they're probably done. I usually like to side with those guys because I tend to think they're hungrier. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm siding with Matt Riddle in his fight. I'm gonna go with Matt Brown. Um, chance the fight could go to a decision, but I think with Cope being a stand-up fighter and Matt Brown having having the heavy hands that he does, that I think Matt Brown is gonna win this thing by way of TKO. Uh, moving on to the bantamweight division, Alex Caceres and Edwin Figueroa. Alex Caceres, if you if that name's not familiar to you, think Bruce Leroy. Uh, Bruce Leroy, six and four uh, pro MMA record, one and two in the UFC, an alumni of the Ultimate Fighter season twelve. Um, all four of uh, Bruce Leroy's career losses have come by way of submission, but three of his six career wins have also come by way of submission. So as a guy that tends to live and die on the ground, uh, against Edwin Figueroa, 8-1 and one in his pro career, 1-1 one and one in the UFC, he's a stand-up fighter. Six of his eight wins have come by knockout or TKO, and he hasn't submitted anybody since 2007. Um, he has a submission win in 2009, but that was a submission due to strikes. Um, so, you know. Uh, I'm going to take Edwin Figueroa in this one. They're both guys that, you know, only have a little bit of UFC experience. Figueroa has a couple more, or a couple, uh, sorry, Caceres has a, uh, one more fight than Figueroa does. So the experience factor is basically nullified. Um... I just, I don't have a lot of faith in, in, in Bruce Leroy. I mean, he was good on the show. He's a character. So that was great as far as the actual fight game goes. Not so much. So I'm going to go with my gut and go with Edwin Figueroa to finish the fight by way of a TKO or a knockout. Moving on to the featherweight division, we have Dustin Poirier and Max Holloway. Max Holloway, a late replacement in this fight. Uh, Dustin Poirier, 11 and 1 in, the, in his pro MMA career, 3 and 0 in the UFC. Um, he's a freestyle fighter. He's a he's a bit of a strange one when you watch him fight, which is good because he's hard to game plan. Uh, he has UFC wins against uh, Grisby, Young, and Pablo Garza. Uh, he has nine finishes out of his 11 pro MMA wins. He is a consensus top 10 featherweight. Um, Poirier is the real deal at this weight class. Um, facing off with another guy making his UFC debut, Max Holloway. 4-0 in his pro career. He's only 20 years old. Uh, he had, I think, three or four fights in X1. Uh, which got him here. Uh, three of his four wins have come by decision, which means he should fit into the UFC perfectly. Uh, but the one thing I really got against this guy, he stole Jens Pulver's nickname. He, Max Holloway's nickname is Lil Evil. 
screw you, that's Jens Pulver's nickname. Anyways, so that's just that's something I had against him. Um, I got I got Poirier in this fight, and I think Poirier is going to finish the fight either pro more than likely by submission, maybe by TKO. But I mean, Poirier's a, a top ten guy at this weight class, and I can't see Max Holloway coming in and having anything for him. So I think it's going to be Dustin Poirier in a walk, and I'm going to call it by submission. He's going to make him tap. Moving on to the middleweight division, and we're on to the main card now, our main card fights. At middleweight, Ed Herman and Clifford Starks. Uh, Ed Herman, another guy I don't like, don't particularly like, but another guy that I got to give him respect because the dude can fight. Uh, 19 and 7 on his pro career, only 6 and 5 in the UFC. It's a lot of experience, but it's not a real great record. Um, an alumni of the Ultimate Fighter Season 3. Uh, he's on a two-fight win streak. His last two fights, he beat uh, t uh, Crazy Tim Crater and Kyle Noak. So, you know, good, solid wins. Uh, facing off with Clifford Stark. Undefeated in his pro career at 8-0. 1-0 in the UFC. He's he's has this style that I like to call wrestle kickboxing. Um, he's not a wrestle boxer because he throws kicks in there. So he's, he's a wrestle kickboxer. Um... Half of his career wins, four of his eight wins have come by decision. Uh, three of his eight wins have come by knockout. So, you know, he is a, he's for sure a good fighter. Um, I'm going to have to give the edge in this one to Ed Herman. I think Ed Herman's going to win this one by decision. Uh, again, I'm not a huge fan of Ed Herman's, but i got to give props that the dude can fight. So I'm going to give this, the edge in the fight to Ed Herman by decision. Uh, bantamweight division, Henan Barrao and Scott Jorgensen, and this is going to be, this has Fight of the Night written all over it. Uh, Henan Barrao, 27-1-1 and in his career, 2-0 and in the UFC, is on the longest current undefeated streak in mixed martial arts at 28 straight fights without a loss. Uh, almost half of his career wins, 13 of 27, have come by submission. He is a very slick ground fighter. Got all choked up there. Scott Jorgensen, 13 and 4 in his pro career, also 2 and 0 in the UFC. He uh, had 10 fights in the WEC, so he's a big veteran of WEC. Uh, 10 of his 17 fights have gone to decision one way or the other. I believe he's won seven decisions, lost three decisions. Um, this one to me is all about Henan Barao. I am so high on Henan Barao. Um, I, uh, so high, and ma matter of fact, I really hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, you know, 28 straight without a loss is just phenomenal. And to do his last two in the UFC proves that it's not like he's not just walking over scrubs. He, he's actually doing it at the UFC level, too. Um, I, I think Henan Barrao's got the stuff to submit Scott Jorgensen. I think more than likely... Their ground games are going to nullify each other enough that it's going to be a unanimous decision victory for Hinan Burrell. Moving up to the welterweight division, we have Josh Koscheck and Mike Pierce. Koscheck, if you'll remember, was originally supposed to fight Carlos Condit because this was supposed to be the George St. Pierre Nick Diaz card. But, of course, GSP gets hurt. Uh, so Condit moves down to, or moves up rather, to fight Nick Diaz, and Josh Koscheck is stepping in there with Mike Pierce. Uh, Koscheck 16 and 5, all but two fights in the UFC, so he's 14 and 5 in the UFC. Uh, an alumni of the Ultimate Fighter season one, so he's been here from the beginning. Uh, and in his last fight after that, uh, his broken orbital bone at the hands of GSP has a vicious knockout with one second left in the first round of Matt Hughes. Uh, anybody that knows me knows I'm a massive Matt Hughes fan, so I was uh, kind of upset when that happened. But I've, I, I've turned around on Josh Koscheck too, so so I wasn't I wasn't too too broken up about it. It was an excellent knockout, and um, I, I'm glad to see that Koscheck came back. From his uh, from his orbital bone injury, Mike Pierce, 13 and four on his career, five and two in the UFC. Um, all four of his career losses have come by decision, uh, and you know he's got five wins in the UFC, but he doesn't really have any real notable wins. He's one of these guys that 
he's still looking for that signature win on his career. He's got he's got victories, but no real like career defining like at the end of the day when he's sitting around and he's 65 he can say he can't say you know uh, I beat Matt Hughes or I beat Matt Sarah or he doesn't have one of these career defining wins I don't think it's going to come this uh, this week either I've got Koscheck in this fight I've got Koscheck winning this fight by way of TKO or knockout whichever you prefer Moving up to the big boys, the heavyweights, Roy Big Country Nelson against Fabricio Verdum returning to the UFC from the barren wasteland that is Strike Force. That is now Strike Force. Uh, Roy Nelson, 16 and 6 on his pro career, 3 and 2 in the UFC. He won the Ultimate Fighter season 10. Uh, has notable UFC wins over Brendan Schaub, Stefan Struve, and a knockout of Marco Krokop. Uh, Fabricio Verdun, 14, 5 and 1 on his pro career, uh, 2 and 2 in the UFC. Again, returning from Strike Force. Um, Fabrizio Verdun is the only man in MMA that can claim that he has beaten both Emelianenko brothers. Um, sad face on that one, but that's okay. Uh, and in his last fight, of course, he lost that dog shit terrible fight to uh, to Alistair Overeem in the quarterfinals of the Strike Force Heavyweight Grand Prix. Uh, that was a terrible fight to watch, almost as bad as Anderson Silva and Damian Maya in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I got Roy Nelson winning this fight by decision. I think uh, the majority of this fight is probably going to be on the ground. Um, and I think uh, Nelson... I don't think Verdum is going to have enough to submit Nelson. Just basically thinking of uh, the, the actual physical size of the man. Um... So I think it's probably going to go to a decision. Roy Nelson, I think, is going to take it. Maybe could be a razor-thin split decision. I actually think this is going to be an exciting fight, even though I predict most of it's going to be on the ground. I'm going to give the nod to Roy Nelson. And your main event, the interim welterweight championship between Nick Diaz and Carlos Condit. Nick Diaz, 26-7-0-1 in his pro career, 7-4 and in the UFC. He was the first WEC and the first Strike Force welterweight champion and is riding an 11-fight winning streak. Going up against Carlos Condit, 27-5. and He's 4-1 and in the UFC. He's also a former WEC welterweight champion. He's riding a four-fight win streak, three of which coming by knockout. Uh, there's been a lot of chatter about this fight. People have been looking forward to this fight for quite some time. Um, my thoughts on it. Nick Diaz is basically the consensus number two welterweight in the world behind George St. Pierre. Um, and I fully support that. As a matter of fact, depending <laughs> depending on the day, basically, I may even put Nick Diaz number one. Right after a Nick Diaz fight, I'm like, oh man, Nick Diaz is the best welterweight in the world. But, you know, that's, that's fandom, and we all succumb to that at times. Um, Carlos Condit is a monster. Carlos Condit is a finisher, man. Um, he is He's on a great streak right now. Um, I, I mean, I like Carlos Condit. I think Carlos Condit's a good fighter. At the same time, I don't think Carlos Condit's going to beat Nick Diaz. Uh, I got Nick Diaz to win this fight. I've got Nick Diaz to finish this fight. Um, you know, there's so much hate from, like, casual fans about Nick Diaz. Because they, they look at, you know, those losses, like when he lost to Diego Sanchez and when he lost to Carl Parisian and, like, fights back in, like, 2006. And they look at him like, oh, you know, he was in UFC and he couldn't hack it, so he had to go down to Strike Force and, you know, fight in Strike Force and Dream and, and all this stuff. Nick Diaz is a killer. Nick Diaz, Nick Diaz has the best boxing in mixed martial arts, and Lord help you if you want to take the man to the ground. I mean, you know, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu all day. Um, I don't think Carlos Condit has anything for Nick Diaz that, that Diaz can't hang with. If Paul Daly or Mario Zoromskis couldn't knock Nick Diaz out, is Carlos Condit going to knock Nick Diaz out? I don't think so. And again, 
you try to think, okay, well, geez, I can't win the stand-up. Maybe I should take him to the ground. You don't want to take Nick Diaz to the ground. You just That's just not something that you want to do. Um, Nate Diaz, in his last couple of fights, has proven the effectiveness of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And I would claim that Nick Diaz has better Jiu-Jitsu than Nate does. So, you know... <laughs> <laughs> what what exactly is Carlos Condit to do? Uh, again, you you come with, you come up with a guy whose boxing and striking style is as unorthodox as Nick Diaz's is, and like Nick Diaz gets in your head when when you're fighting him. Nobody nobody talks shit in the octagon like Nick Diaz does. Uh, and Nick Diaz gets in his opponent's heads. Nick Diaz makes Paul Daly shoot for takedowns. That's that's how bad Nick Diaz gets in your head. So I've got Nick Diaz in this fight. I've got him winning either by TKO or submission, more than likely TKO, to become the interim welterweight champion, setting up the fight that Nick Diaz has deserved since day one. That's the fight with George St. Pierre for the undisputed welterweight championship, at which time I believe, firmly believe, Nick Diaz will become the welterweight champion. There's my picks for UFC 143. I'll run them down for you one more time. I've got uh, Stephen Thompson beating Dan Stetkin. Rafael Natal beating Michael Kuiper. I've got Matt Riddle beating Henry Martinez. Matt Brown beating Chris Cope. I've got Edwin Figueroa beating Alex Caceres. I've got Dustin Poirier beating Max Holloway. And on, starting on the main card, I've got Ed Herman beating Clifford Starks, Hanan Barrow beating Scott Jorgensen, I've got Josh Koscheck beating Mike Pierce, I've got Roy Nelson squeaking out a win against Fabrizio Verdum, and in the main event, I've got Nick Diaz beating Carlos Condit to become the interim welterweight champion. Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, Flatline MMA and Athletics, Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, pulling the plug on the competition. See you later.